this video, we will talk about phenomena that at first glance break the laws of physics and cannot be explained logically. Some of these objects and phenomena can be observed in nature itself. Other objects are man-made. But do these things really break the laws of physics, or is it a myth? This video is a collection of unusual things. Watch it to the end and get rid of prejudices. Things that break the laws of physics. Let's start with something simple. Square wheels can be considered as an unusual object that contradicts our common sense. The very name itself evokes a protest in our soul, disrupting the foundation of our life experience. The reason for this protest is the inertia of thinking. Since childhood, all of us see only round wheels. Indeed, almost everything created by man to move on land cars, trains, tractors, motorcycles, bicycles. Everything rolls on round wheels. Wait a minute, somebody in the audience might say. What about Caterpillar vehicles? These are tractors, all-terrain vehicles, construction and military vehicles that ride on caterpillars. So we can do without wheels. That's a great question. Now you'll learn the answer and see that Caterpillar vehicles also roll on round wheels. Take a closer look and you'll notice that the body of the crawler machinery always rests on small round rolling wheels. In fact, a bulldozer, a tank, an all-terrain vehicle rolls on them on its own steel road, caterpillars. As we can see, the round wheel comes into the picture here too. As a result, everyday practice forms a strong logical chain in our mind. Land vehicles ride on wheels, wheels are always round. There can be no other wheels. Yes, we are convinced that there cannot be square wheels. However, this is where our usual logic fails. In science, such a logical fallacy is categorized as non sequitur. In this instance, it means that if we have not seen square wheels, it doesn't mean that such wheels cannot exist. The possibility of existence and practical application of square wheels was proved by a famous team of Mythbusters. They made such wheels and mounted them on a car. Do you think it drove? Those who answered yes would be right. Indeed, the car drove on square wheels. However, such a ride can hardly be called comfortable. Shaking during the movement is simply terrible. Some relief comes with speeding up, but still there are some very strong shakes. Naturally, traveling in such a car is not pleasant. However, it seems to us that square wheels have some advantages over round wheels. What do you think? Which wheel will provide better off-road performance when driving on mud, loose sand, deep snow? Of course, square wheels would win. Their angles would not let the car slip where round wheels are helpless. The important thing is that the car should have all-wheel drive. As a result, the things that we thought were impossible turn out not to be only possible, but also useful in some conditions. Let's move on to the next example that literally disrupts our everyday experience. It's so unusual that it may seem to violate the laws of physics. The power of the example is especially great because it involves a sense that is not easily fooled, the sense of pain. I think most viewers will agree with this. Yes, we know how easily our sights can be deceived and how often our hearing leads us astray let alone the sense of smell and taste, because the things are so vague and fuzzy here. But it's different with our sense of pain. Our sense of touch is responsible for pain, and it functions quite reliably. For example, if some magician manages to give you the illusion that molten lead is cold, this illusion will be shattered once you touch the molten lead with your finger. You would feel the pain and pull your hand away. You can't fool the thermoreceptors. Now watch a man dipping his fingers into molten lead. He pulls his hand back quickly, then repeats the motion several times. The temperature of the molten lead is over 327 degrees Celsius, 620.6 degrees Fahrenheit. But nothing happens to his hand. There is no burn, and apparently the experimenter is not even in pain. How is that possible? Maybe it's some kind of deception, falsification? It would seem that according to all the laws of physics, even a short-term contact of the skin with a medium heated above 327 degrees Celsius, 620.6 Fahrenheit, should inevitably damage it, guaranteeing a severe burn with sharp pain. 
Let's watch the slow motion video and if there are any tricks, let's try to spot them. The slow motion video confirms it all. The man really dips his fingers into the molten metal. On the screen you can clearly see the typical splashes. You can see the depth of the immersion. It's clear that the fingers do not have any means of protection. So what's the secret behind it all? Let's watch further and get the exact answer. The secret of the experience is the light and frost effect. This is a physical phenomenon in which a liquid near a surface, the temperature of which is much higher than the boiling point of the liquid, forms an insulating vapor layer. The effect is named after the German physician Johann Gottlob Leidenfrost, who described it in his work, a tract about some qualities of common water, in 1756. The temperature at which this effect occurs is called the Leidenfrost point. For water, it's approximately 193 degrees Celsius, 379 Fahrenheit. The melt temperature of the lead in our example is much higher, so the Leidenfrost effect is possible. In our example, it is water that the experimenter uses to create a protective insulating layer of vapor. Before dipping his fingers into the molten lead, he dips his palm into the water. Of course, this moment is not shown on the video to impress the viewer even more and create the illusion of contradiction to the laws of physics. By the way, the authors of this video know these laws pretty well. Pay your attention to the clean surface of the molten metal. There's no slag, impurities, contaminants on it. It's carefully cleaned of anything unwanted. Experimenters realize that if anything with a temperature above 300 degrees Celsius, about 600 degrees Fahrenheit, sticks to the fingers, then no light and frost effect would help. The laws of physics are inexorable. They are always true, and sometimes they're used to create things that do not match our usual ideas about technology. You're about to see a great example of such a thing, but let's start with something funny from the life of the military. Jokes among military men are a regular thing and sometimes soldiers are asked a question during moments of rest. You know very well that a shell from a cannon flies in a curved trajectory. So if you put the cannon on its side, can you shoot around the corner? Sometimes to everyone's amusement, the answer is yes, you can. Of course, the idea of putting the cannon on its side to shoot around a corner sounds ridiculous, but it reveals the military's interest in such shooting. This interest arose with the sad experience of the positional battles of World War I and the street battles of World War II. Analysis of combat operations suggest that a curved barrel would give the shooter a great advantage when firing from a trench, from behind the corner of a building, etc. With such a barrel, his chances of hitting the enemy while remaining out of range of return fire increase. These chances may increase even more if the shooter can see what he's shooting at and has the ability to aim. Another application of the curved barrel was to fire at dead zones around the tank. For this purpose, the curved barrel should be mounted in a ball bearing on the turret and equipped with a periscopic sight. As you can see in the conditions of the First and Second World Wars, a machine gun with a curved barrel could perfectly complement the arsenal of an infantry platoon and increase the level of protection of armored vehicles. Realizing this, gunsmiths of the warring countries made attempts to implement the idea. From the technical point of view, there are two ways to do it. The barrel can be curved with loading and locking mechanisms as well as the trigger mechanism remaining unchanged. Alternatively, the barrel can be left straight but the weapon can be bent, making it fold up somewhere behind the barrel. Both methods, as always, have their pros and cons. A curved barrel wears out quickly, the bullets in it deform, the weapon is difficult to balance. At the same time, such a weapon is easy to put into production on the basis of existing serial models. Bending the weapon behind the barrel allows using a wide arsenal of standard ammunition, but requires solving complex technical and production problems, unless we're talking about a primitive model with a curved buttstock. I wonder which option you'd choose. Bending the barrel or bending the gun behind the barrel? Try yourself as a gun designer. In a minute, you'll find out which option the history chose. Obviously, in war conditions, it's easier to use the first option. That's exactly what Germany did in 1944. The Germans simply developed the Krumlauf, a bent barrel attachment for their famous STG-44 serial automatic rifle. 
Various models of the Krumlauf provided 45 degrees, 60 degrees and 90 degree barrel rotation, as well as 30 degree barrel lift. There's also a version of the MG42 and a tank version. Most infantry nozzles were made for the STG44 with 30 degree tilt. The curved barrel nozzles had a very short service life. About 300 shots for the 30 degree version and 160 shots for the 45 degree version. The reason for this was the heavy loads on the barrel. In 1944, however, no barrels could save Nazi Germany. In the first post-war period, the Soviet Union showed the greatest attention to curved barrels. It developed the Goryanov medium machine gun with a curvature angle of up to 60 degrees. The Kalashnikov light machine gun with a curvature angle of up to 90 degrees for firing at dead zones of armored vehicles. And the Degtyryov light machine gun with a curvature angle of up to 45 degrees for infantry. The barrel life was brought to 1,000 shots. Caliber of all designs was 7.62 millimeters. Curved barrels of larger calibers were not developed. In the West, there were no noticeable efforts in this direction. The new military doctrines did not envision large-scale positional warfare and street battles. However, the idea of firing around the corner wasn't forgotten. Its second version, with a bend behind the barrel, found application in special forces. The most promising example of such weapons is the corner shot system. It was developed by an Israeli Special Forces veteran. The weapon consists of two parts connected by a hinge. The maximum angle of bending is 63 degrees. The front part is fitted with a regular pistol with a straight barrel, a laser sight, flashlight and video camera. The second part is equipped with a buttstock, trigger mechanism, control panel and display. The system is versatile. Not only various small arms can be installed in the front part, but also devices for firing with rubber bullets and tear gas grenades. What you've just seen proves one simple truth. It happens in life that a ridiculous idea, contradicting common sense, is suddenly implemented and becomes useful. This is where a curious point arises. We see that a man can invent a thing that should not exist, but in the end it does and it's useful. But what about nature? Does it happen that we say, no, this is impossible, but it exists and lives beside us? I wonder how you answered that question. If you said yes, then you are right. And you're about to see one of the proofs in your rightness. Look, this is an Alpine Ibex, also known as the Steinbock Alpine Goat. At first glance, there's nothing remarkable about it. It cannot surprise with its size, bizarre colors, or the strength of its jaws. It has long horns, but in general, it's a peaceful herbivore. Ibex lives in the center of densely populated Europe, where it would seem that there is no wildlife left. The only place that it has not been reached by civilization is the alpine rocks and gorges in the mountains at an altitude of 1,000 meters, 330 feet and more. But is it possible to live there? Who besides birds and insects can find a place on the steep walls? Can a four-legged mammal find food and breed there? Yes. Watch further, get answers, and see the impossible with your own eyes. In the process of evolution, the alpine ibex and its mountain relatives all over the world have learned to walk on almost vertical walls. Just look how they do it. For them, the death-defying moment on ledges as wide as a cash register receipt is just a normal family walk for a patch of grass. Or just look at this incredible scene. A she-goat and a baby goat are climbing up the huge flat wall of the dam. The terrible height doesn't frighten them. They find the smallest ledges and confidently move up. They only want to eat the salt exuding on the wall. After the meal, they'll descend. The sight of their descent is mind-blowing. Observing these movements unwittingly evokes admiration and amazement. Our consciousness protests it can't be, but we see it is, and our mind bursts with questions. How can an animal on hooves walk on walls at great height in any direction? How do they make their amazing jumps with sharp and precise stopping on spots where there is nothing even to catch hold of? What is the secret of such capabilities? The answers are already waiting for you. 
You're about to find out how skillfully mountain goats use the laws of physics without knowing anything about them. The main secret of alpine ibexes lies in the special structure of their hooves. They're arranged in such a way that they don't slip on smooth, highly inclined surfaces. The hooves are bifurcated into toes. They're sharp, narrow, and can pull apart greatly. At the bottom of each toe, there is a relatively soft leather sole, and on the outer edges, there's a special protrusion, a rim, which is strong, rigid, but not as hard as bone. This arrangement provides a reliable grip on rocks. The hoof tissue regrows quickly so that the hoof is always in the right condition. The design is optimal, offering the best mechanics of interaction with the surface of stone, crushed stone, sand in various combinations. A surprisingly clever application of the laws of physics. The hooves of the ibex are an excellent tool, and it perfectly knows how to use them. Its skills have been refined by evolution, developed and strengthened by continuous training literally from the moment of birth. Nature has a knack of creating what seems impossible to us. You've just seen a couple of stories about how the impossible, in our opinion, can be possible and even useful. But what about the opposite? Is there something that we think is possible, but the laws of nature say it's not? Does it happen that common sense, our practical experience say, everything is obvious, according to the laws of physics, it must work. However, nothing works in reality. A vivid example of such contradiction is the story of perpetual motion machines. Now we'll show you two ingenious schemes of perpetual motion machines. They are simple enough, but guessing why they don't work is not easy. Let's start with a seemingly very simple water wheel. According to the inventor, the wheel should spin forever, and various useful equipment can be attached to its axes. The main component in the scheme is a capillary tube. Water rises through it, comes back to the blades of the wheel, drops on them, and, having spun the wheel, flows from the blades back into the vessel. The whole thing is then repeated. Note, if the power is not enough, the number of capillary tubes can be increased, and all problems with the load can be solved. You may agree at first glance everything is real. Water will certainly rise along the capillary. Anyone knows it. Getting on the blade, it will inevitably create a force to rotate the wheel and so on. Everything seems to be right, but we are all educated people and we know that nature will say no. It's impossible to create a perpetual motion machine. This is a consequence of the fundamental laws of physics. There is a strange contradiction. It turns out that according to some laws of physics, the water wheel is supposed to spin, but according to others, it's not. In fact, there is no contradiction. You just need to correctly apply the laws of physics. The point is that the force of surface tension which raises the water on the capillary will not let it flow out of it. So nothing will drip on the blades of the water wheel and it will stand still. So the water wheel didn't work. Shall we try it with magnets? For example, the Macintosh wheel. The idea of a perpetual motion machine with a wheel and a magnet was patented back in 1823. The idea is also quite simple and beautiful. Look, we'll take a wheel with a groove inside and a steel ball rolling freely along that groove. We bring a strong magnet to the wheel, moving in the plane of the wheel perpendicular to its axis. The ball, attracted to the magnet, rolls up the groove and the wheel spins. The mechanical analog of a squirrel in a wheel. Naturally, according to the inventor, the wheel will spin forever until the magnet weakens or the ball is worn out. In fact, the ball will just rise a little along the groove and the system will stop in a position of equilibrium. There will be no movement. Nature will say no to another perpetual motion machine. Well, okay, but what about wheels and pendulums that spin for a long time? Shouldn't we believe our own eyes? Do not worry, in such cases your sight does not mislead you. You simply need to be sure that there is definitely a source of energy. It may be hidden, concealed. If there's no such source, then an external source is somehow cleverly used. It's definitely there. The laws of physics do not lie. People just can't get past the idea of a perpetual motion machine, and sometimes it leads to funny situations. A good example here is Heron's Fountain. 
The description of this fountain, working without any pumps and without connection to any external vessels, came to us from ancient manuscripts. Heron's invention was replicated and demonstrated to the public. Part of the audience immediately mistook the toy for a perpetual motion machine. There's no doubt that even today, even among those who have understood the scheme of the fountain, there will be enthusiasts who will try to loop this scheme and turn it into a perpetual motion machine. Let's see what this famous fountain is. Let's find out how it works. The design basis consists of three vertically arranged vessels cleverly connected by tubes. The upper vessel is the bowl of the fountain. The bottom of the bowl is connected to the bottom of the lower vessel by a tube. If there's water in the bowl, there is a column of liquid in the tube, which, connecting with the liquid in the lower vessel, creates some air pressure above its surface. If the lower vessel is airtight, it will have a pressure equal to the weight of the column of the liquid. Heron's idea is to apply this pressure to the upper part of the middle vessel. It contains water too and will be pressurized as long as there is a column of liquid in the tube from the bowl to the lower vessel. Now this pressure should be utilized. To do this, a tube is run from the bowl from the nozzle of the fountain almost to the bottom of the middle vessel. Under the influence of air pressure, water rises to the nozzle of the fountain and it begins to work. It looks magical. There's no reservoir above the bowl, there are no pistons or mechanisms, but the fountain works. No noise, just a slight splash of water and that's it. The most important question is how long can it work? The answer to this question will once again deprive the fans of the perpetual motion machine of any chance of success. With the correct starting setup, Heron's fountain works as long as there is sufficient hydrostatic column pressure in the tube from the bowl to the lower vessel. This means that with water in the middle vessel and the air in the lower vessel, the fountain will work as long as there is water in the bowl. However, water leaves the bowl faster than it comes in due to pressure loss and resistance in the tubes, nozzle and also to evaporation. This difference would always be there, therefore the fountain cannot be looped and turned into a perpetual motion machine. We get another convincing proof that the laws of physics are inexorable. The idea of a perpetual motion machine was once very popular and caused a lot of hassle for scientists. Today, the idea of another sort of engine is attracting more and more attention. The consequences of its emergence will be no less tremendous. But unlike Perpetuum Mobile, the fundamental possibility of its creation is scientifically proven. In this story, we'll talk about warp drive. With its help, people will travel through space at speeds exceeding the speed of light. You may say it's impossible. It contradicts the fundamental laws of physics. I'd like to reassure the skeptics. A spaceship with such a drive moving at any speed doesn't violate the postulates of the constancy of the speed of light and the impossibility of its achievement by any material object. I know it's hard to believe, but the principle of warp drive operation is based on strict compliance with the laws of physics. And right now you'll learn what this principle is. Let's watch the video further to discover the wonders of space and time. The idea of warp drive isn't new. Back in the last century, science fiction writers actively used stories with starships warping space. By strongly compressing the space in front of it while stretching it out behind, the warp drive moves forward the region of space where the ship is in. Note, there is a kind of warp bubble of space moving forward. The ship rests inside this bubble and it's stationary relative to space here. So the postulates of the theory of relativity are not violated. The idea of warp drive gets around these postulates. Wait, so it's just science fiction the distrustful viewer might object? You mean Star Trek and so on? Don't jump to conclusions. The idea of a warp drive ceased to be science fiction in 1994 when Miguel Alcubier Moya published an article with a mathematical description of warp bubble space in the reputable and prestigious scientific journal Classical and Quantum Gravity. Since then, the fantastic warp bubble has become a mathematical object, Alcubier bubble. In general, it's now proven that it's possible to build a warp drive, but it requires exotic matter with negative mass. If we manage to find such matter in the amount of 33 Earth masses, next to nothing, then we can consider building a warp drive. 
It's hard to say when humanity will have such technology capabilities. Nevertheless, let us hope that the fantastic drive will become a reality. Warp drive solves the main problem of space travel, but before we can fly to the stars, we have to get into space somehow. Today, we do that with chemical rockets. This technology is well tested, but it requires significant resources. The cost of delivering cargo to near-Earth orbit averages $35,000 per pound, 0.45 kilograms. In the future, reusable rockets may reduce the cost to $50 per pound. But even at this cost, it's impossible to start intensive large-scale space exploration with launching hundreds and thousands of tons of cargo into orbit per day. The space elevator can radically change the situation. The idea is not new either. Konstantin Salkovsky spoke about it back in 1895. For a long time, it seemed to be a fantasy. But today, a number of companies in the US, Europe, China, Japan have already started to develop commercial products of a space elevator. The design of such an elevator is approximately the same in all of the companies and consists of the following elements. Base, cable, counterweight, elevator. In general, it looks like this. The elevator moves along the cable stretched between the ground base and the space counterweight in geostationary orbit. As you can see, it's all very simple. The main challenge is the cable material. The remaining elements can be manufactured today. The length of the cable should be at least 35,786 kilometers, 22,236 miles, because this is the height of the geostationary orbit. The length of the cable determines the capabilities of the elevator. For example, if we make a cable with a length of 144,000 kilometers, 89,000 miles, its end will fly in space at the speed of 10.93 kilometers per second. That's 6.79 miles a second. That's the escape speed for that altitude. It's needed to leave the Earth's orbit and fly to other planets in the solar system. We should dwell on this point for a moment. Someone might wonder how this speed is obtained. Let's find out. We know that the Earth rotates at a constant angular velocity and makes a complete rotation of 360 degrees in 24 hours. In one rotation, a point on the equator travels a path equal to the length of the equator. Now imagine that we have stretched 144,000 km, 89,000 mile long cable from this point in a radial direction into space. Its end rotates at the same angular velocity as the Earth. Can you imagine the gigantic distance it travels in the same 24 hours? That's how the escape speed is achieved. It's also possible to drop the cable from the Moon to the geosynchronous orbit of the Earth. Then the length of the cable would be about 362,000 kilometers. It is much longer than in options from the Earth, but the cable in this case would be significantly thinner and easier to manufacture. Obviously, in any case, the cable should be very durable and weigh as little as possible. Everybody already knows that it should be made of nanotubes, but so far the available materials provide only half of the required strength. Despite this, NASA experts believe that the concept of a space elevator is very promising. NASA even holds contests for the best model of the space elevator. That's how seriously the agents' experts treat this idea. According to their forecasts, Japanese and Chinese projects will be implemented by 2050. The cost of delivering one kilogram of cargo will then drop to $25. However, it's not that seamless. There are experts who consider space elevator projects difficult to implement. These include the famous Elon Musk. In particular, he claimed that this task is too complicated in technical terms. It's easier to build a bridge between Los Angeles and Tokyo than to erect an elevator to orbit. Despite such assessments, optimism still wins and we hope that in a couple of decades anyone will be able to take an elevator directly into space for no more than $1,000. A space elevator can hardly be called an ordinary lifting mechanism, but you've seen that it is feasible and will be made one day. Some of you might then wonder what unusual ways of lifting loads have already been tested in practice. Don't rush to look for the answer on the internet. We've already prepared something interesting for you. Do you think it's possible to lift a car with an ordinary domestic vacuum cleaner? Many will doubt in reply and rightly so. It's really hard to imagine such a thing, but nevertheless, it's possible. 
The effectiveness of such a method was tested by a famous team of Mythbusters. To verify this hypothesis, they made three large suction cups, placed them on the hood, roof and trunk lid of a sedan. Then the suction cups were connected to the inlet of a domestic vacuum cleaner with the help of hoses. In addition, the suction cups were connected to a platform using metal rods. The platform was attached to the hook of the crane and the vacuum cleaner was switched on. The vacuum cleaner worked for some time, pumping air out of the suction cups. After the vacuum cleaner, as the experimenters believed, reached the limit of its capabilities, the crane driver switched on the lift. The car was lifted and the suction cups could hold its weight. What do you think the experimenters did to confirm the role of the vacuum cleaner? They turned it off. The car crashed down immediately. With the vacuum cleaner motor off, the air went in the opposite direction from the atmosphere under the suction cups. The pressure differential rapidly decreased and the car broke loose and fell. The secret of the trick is in the large area of the suction cups. This is necessary because in pneumatics, similarly to hydraulics, the force is proportional to the pressure and the area of interaction. In our case, the force with which the atmosphere presses the suction cup to the surface depends on the technical capabilities of the vacuum cleaner and the suction cup area. That's why it worked out well with large suction cups and the experiment was successful. In the previous story, the application of the laws of physics does not cause any difficulties and the result of the experiment is easily predicted. But this is not always the case. There are quite simple cases where motion clearly contradicts the well-known laws of physics. A great example of such a contradiction is the paradox of a sailboat and a fan. Let's look at the diagram. You see a boat with a sail and a fan at the stern. Let's imagine the fan is turned on. What happens to the boat? Will it move? If so, in which direction? Many people think that the system is closed loop and blowing into the sail is like pulling your own hair. The boat is supposed to stand still. Indeed, the fan blows air towards the sail. This air jet has a certain amount of momentum. According to the law of momentum conservation, the same momentum, but in the opposite direction, is received by the hull of the boat. If there were no sail, the boat would sail backwards. But there's a sail. The sail meets the air from the fan, receives and transmits the received momentum to the boat's hull. This momentum is equal to the momentum from the fan, but it's directed forward. As a result, everything is balanced and according to Newton's third law, the boat should stay in place. Surely the boat in the picture will not go anywhere. It will always stay in place. But in reality, it is different. In reality, the boat fan system is not a closed system. The boat can sail backwards. It can stay in place. It can sail forwards. There's no paradox in this. It all depends on the ratio of fan power to sail area. If the sail is small, then part of the air jet from the fan passes by and it doesn't give its momentum. As a result, the momentum of the fan is not fully balanced and the boat sails backwards. If we increase the sail area, at some value the boat will stay in place. The most interesting part, if we increase the fan speed with this sail, the boat will move forward. Forward movement occurs due to the fact that when the fan speed is increased, in addition to the increased jet momentum, a higher pressure is created at the inner surface of the sail. Under the influence of this pressure, the air, having given its momentum to the sail, slides on its inner surface and is thrown back, giving an additional momentum, pushing the boat forward. Furthermore, we should keep in mind that when the sail is filled with air, the resistance to forward motion is less than the resistance to backward motion. Yes, the reality is very different from the simplified scheme in the picture. Our next topic is also related to moving on water, but this time it will not be a boat, but a motorcycle that will move. Someone will instantly recall the special water scooters and wonder, what's so unusual about them? Yes, we can hardly surprise anyone with a water scooter nowadays, but we will show you something more interesting. Now you're going to see an Enduro-class motorcycle rushing across rough terrain. There's no doubt about it, it's a true Enduro. It's built for racing over bumps, holes, ditches, but what is it? It's jumping into a riverbank and it's not slowing down. Failed brakes, dirt on the glass and the rider can't see the river? Apparently that's the case. Look at this. The bike rushes through the shallow water, raising fountains of water and mud. There's depth ahead, we're sure. It'll all be over in a second. The heavy Enduro will go underwater and hopefully the motorcyclist won't get hurt. However, something completely different happens instead. 
The motion continues. The motorcycle races along the surface of the river, beautifully ejecting jets of water from under the rear wheel. After riding across the river's surface, the motorcyclist heads towards the shore, rides out onto it, and stops. Now we can get a better look at the motorcycle. Could this be a new version of an amphibious vehicle? There are cars of this kind, so why couldn't there be an amphibious motorcycle? We can take a closer look and see there are no floats in the design. In the strong frame of the Enduro, there are no empty capacities at all, except for the fuel tank, of course. So, in full accordance with Archimedes' law, this bike can't float. So why doesn't it sink? Is it breaking the law of physics? No, our Enduro doesn't break the laws of physics. Yes, it can't float, but it can glide and slide on the water surface. For this purpose, it is equipped with small skis. The front wheel rotates in the slot of one of them. Two more are installed behind so that the rear wheel can rotate between them. The designers have not forgotten about the suspension system. The movable structure of aluminium arms provides stability not only during normal movement on the water, but also when jumping into the water from a springboard. Yes, after a jump, the bike doesn't sink, does not tip over, but quickly goes into glide mode. Figuratively speaking, we can say that the Archimedes law yielded to the laws of hydrodynamics, and we got a stunning show. The subject of our next story is much smaller and doesn't make a noise like an enduro. However, its movement has long attracted the attention of serious scientists, and their interest in it still has not faded. We're talking about the tippy top. It looks like a ball with its top cut off by about a fifth of its diameter. On the plane of the cut, there is the stem of the top perpendicular to it. If we want to spin a tippy top, we should use the stem. That's exactly what will be done now. Watch carefully. Beyond any doubt, the difference between the movement of an ordinary top and its tippy top is fundamental. But first, it spins like an ordinary top. Then it gradually tilts on its side and the stem begins to make circles. The tilt continues, the stem touches the surface of the table, the top turns over completely and stands upright, rotating on the stem. The process of the tippy top overturning during rotation is amazing. Any viewer realizes that the top is much more stable standing on the ball than on the stem. This is easy to test. Swing the top in the usual position. It will return to its original position like a roly-poly toy. This is natural since the center of mass is lower than the center of the spherical part of the top. Now let's try to put it on the stem. It is impossible to do that at all because it is so unstable in this position. So it's clear with the balance in the resting position, but everything changes once the top starts spinning. Tippy top goes out of balance, tilts, and as soon as the stem touches the table, it flips over. Resting on the stem, it spins in a vertical position for a while until the charge of kinetic energy is exhausted. So, the top has flipped over and chosen the most unstable position, which is very strange. Our experience tells us that this is not how it usually happens, and everything tends to equilibrium in the most stable position. What's the secret? Why does the top get upside down? Some quantum effects again, mysterious fields? No, everything happens according to the law of classical mechanics. You only need to take into account the friction force at the point of contact of the top with the support. When the top rotates at the point of contact, the friction force creates a torque that raises the center of mass. In the tippy top, it is below the geometric center of the spherical bottom part. This torque tilts the top. At the point of touching the rotating stem, another frictional force is added, hence another torque needs to raise the center of mass. As a result, this center of mass rises to the maximum height, which corresponds to the vertical position with the stem at the bottom. Of course, the description of such motion without vector products of torque and angular velocities would seem unconvincing to someone, but let's not turn our video into a lecture on theoretical mechanics. The fact is that the unnatural motion of the tippy top occurs in strict accordance with the laws of physics. So, you've just seen that one can create extremely unusual and even unbelievable things and do the seemingly impossible by using ordinary laws. Now you have fewer prejudices, and your understanding of the laws of nature has broadened.